chapter 24. See you, Parker. Love you, man. Love you, dog. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Luke chapter 24. Are you comfortable? I want to mention to you and remind you that uh, last year I had a, a musician preacher in by the name of Eddie B. I mean, remember Eddie. Eddie blew this place apart, man. I mean, he was, he was amazing. I was, and the reason that he goes by an initial is because he does a lot of prison ministry. And his family was threatened when they found out what his full name was. And so because of that, he just goes by Eddie B. And he lives out of uh, in uh, New Mexico. Well, he'll be with us next month. First week, midweek, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I'm excited about having him here. Amen. You're going to love him. If you weren't here, I know some people think, Eddie B., I don't know about that. But what an I, I'm, I'm serious. Very few people come in here and just make, set me back, and I go, uh, that was amazing. And uh, that's how I felt about Eddie, his passion for God. And I think that's such a, a need for the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 24. In Luke 24, we realize that Jesus has died. In, in dying, if you understand that the preaching of the early church was about the resurrection of Jesus, that it's Christ in us, the hope of glory, they always preached about him coming back alive because they were, they were that generation that knew that he had. And so the generations have moved on. And it seems like we forget about talking about the resurrection, how powerful it is. But when Jesus, last week I talked to you about an, an empty tomb. I talked to you about empty clothes, his grave clothes. And the question had to come up was where did Jesus find his clothes? If he left his clothes in the tomb, where did he find the clothes he was wearing? I posed that to several preachers. I could not get an answer. <laughs> Nobody knew where Jesus kept his suitcase. And then the third one was his uncanny appearances, the fact that Jesus just kept showing up. He showed up at the tomb, and he looked like a gardener. He showed up in the room where the disciples were afraid. Where are we going to find him again today showing up again? And what happens in our lives is, is when we start, when G our Jesus starts diminishing, listen to me. Through this pandemic, Jesus began to diminish in some people's hearts and become to come alive in other people's hearts. It was, a, it was like a, a separation of some sense that we, were, we forgot that we were people of faith. There were, were people that um, stand against fear. There were people that stand against uh, people that have a lack of common sense. You know, one thing I love about the little country church is that you've got common sense. Amen. And common sense is uncommon. Mm -hmm. Amen. So people, what happens is people just cease to desire just to re relieve themselves of the pain and the struggle of trying to attain their dreams. They become zombies trapped in a lukewarm state of existence. Their philosophy causes them to sink into a life of mediocrity. And many times if you're not careful, you'll just live, marry, buy vehicles, accumulate wealth, have children, and you'll die without passion. And what's important in our life is keep our passion alive. I want to talk to you this morning about living with two hearts. The truth of the matter is, I have found, it's going to be a while before I get there, sis. We, I've found that our hearts, uh, even my heart, you know, I get to this conference and it's like my heart was kind of slow. It's kind of like, here we go, I'm going into another conference with pastors. And next thing I know, a young man gets up and preaches that's, that's 30 years younger than me. And, and you got to understand, when you're my age and you've been through 40 years of ministry, you see a guy stand up who's 30 years old and starts to preach. And say, What's he got to say? Only to realize that his dad started one of the largest churches in Oklahoma and died in his 50s. And to hear that young man get up and start preaching from out of the overflow of what he learned from his dad and that how what he had to go through to bring that church back alive again, the fire of God started welling back up in my life. I realize I don't care how old you are, you can get into a place where all of a sudden your heart is slow, where you just forget that Jesus ever really did anything in you. So to keep your first love alive is very important. Can I get Amen. 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 So you got you got to hear it. It 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 was it's easy to slip back into the old habits of mind and living and going back. It, it is a natural a fact that it happens. Amen. Why do we drift towards weariness and chronic spiritual fatigue and being distant, becoming evasive? Why does our life in Christ so often gather moss rather than bear fruit? You got to ask yourself why others seem to, you know, they don't get stuck. They keep right on moving. They break free, you know, and they, they keep pressing forward. In Luke 24, we find two disciples. 
And out of the 12, they're probably of the 70 disciples. Remember, Jesus had 12 that he ran with for three years. But he had another 70 that he sent out. So the scripture says that now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, we know one of them is named Cleophas. We don't know who the other disciple is. Some have said that Luke was not a disciple. He was one that just appeared and looked into the life of Christ. Others say that Luke was one of these guys. So who knows? They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. You know, you get two guys together, they're going to talk. You ladies may not realize this, but men do talk. And often when they get together, right, H? I mean, we get together, we just start talking. They talk, they discuss these things with each other. Jesus himself, now here's that third thing again, that uncanny appearance. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they kept, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Now, again, you realize that I made an instant uh, uh, a thing about his clothing, right? You always see Jesus in either a white or a brown, long tunic or something of that nature. But he's dressed different. Again, when he came out of the tomb, Mary thought he was a gardener. You know, gardeners dress a different way. You know, gardeners when you see them. You know, people by what they're wearing. So now he comes up behind them, and they don't recognize him. Evidently, whatever he's wearing has given a pose of almost a, uh, uh, they've, he's lost his distinction. So he asked him, what are you discussing? Hey, guys, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleophas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that, I, that have happened there in the last uh, couple of days? What things, Jesus asked? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us, speaking about Mary. They went to the tomb early in the morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels. Do you remember what Mary saw when she looked in the tomb? Two angels, one set at the head, one set at the tail. Even that's where the angels were. But John and Peter didn't see angels when they came. The angels weren't in the tomb when they went in, only when Mary went in. Where were the angels hiding? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Then some of our companions went to the tomb. They found it just as the woman had said, but, in, but him they did not see. Mm. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses, that's Genesis, and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Hold on a second. Listen, listen. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the Word is God. So he was in the beginning. So here's Jesus stopping and talking to these disciples. And started with Moses, starts moving forward. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? My prayer today is as we open the scriptures that your heart opens up and starts catching fire. Because the truth of the matter is, as you walk through life, your heart starts slowing down. You start, life starts piling on you. There's problems. The longer you're on this planet, the more problems you seem to have. And if you're not careful, the only thing that can fire your heart back up again is the scriptures. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for the word of God. Let your anointing fall on my lips to, for people to hear and receive. Lord, let me wear you like a coat and speak as your oracle. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. 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 Everybody shout a big amen. 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 God bless you. I hope you see this story in your mind.
Because I sure do. I see two guys discouraged. Their hearts are slow. They're walking away. Their Jesus has died. They, they've heard rumors, but they haven't seen him. And he comes up behind them and begins to talk to them. And they haven't recognized him. How many times have you sat with somebody on a plane and you didn't recognize? How many times have you walked with somebody in a mall next to them and not recognized? You know, the scripture talks about all the time that even angels will show. I'm careful how I treat people. Because I never know if that's going to be an angel from God. Yeah. Amen. And now you always think you will recognize them. The scripture says it won't. It's been a stressful week for the disciples. The one they had pinned their hopes and dreams on. Jesus, he'd been falsely arrested, accused, amen, beaten, unbelievably crucified. They rolled the stone over a grave that he had borrowed, and they thought it was over. Then they heard he had risen. How much more could they take? When I was a young man, I heard about Jesus. I didn't know Jesus. I just heard about him. I went to a few VBSs, vacation Bible schools, begged to by my friends. But I still didn't know Jesus. There was something different about hearing about him and, not in, and knowing him. So the tomb is empty and Jesus has risen. And as these two disciples, they're heading home. They're going away. They're leaving away from where all the, 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 the beatings and the crucifixion take taking place. And then they get interrupted. You know, I've often called him the holy wild. Because that, that to me is who he is. Amen. He walks on water. He's a wave walker. Can I get an amen? amen? He walks on the waves in the darkness of the night. The height of the waves did not bother him. The water didn't bother him. He's walking on the waves, and then Peter and the disciples see him. They scream, thought he was a ghost. I thank God for the wave walker that has walked with me in the waves. Amen. He's been with me. But let me tell you something else Jesus has been to me. He's been a valley walker too. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. You're a valley walker. Thank God for valley walkers. Can I get an amen? You have friends who are valley walkers in your life. They have been with you through the valley. Thank God for the mountains. I love the mountains. The mountains. I go to Colorado just to go up in the mountains. I want to get up in the mountains. The fresh air. Woo! Uh, I, I took my kids one time up to Pikes Peak. You know, it's about 14,000 feet. Man, we got all the way up to Pikes Peak, and they jumped out of the van, took off running, and one of them just fell down, couldn't breathe. <laughs> Let me tell you something about mountaintops. Mountaintops are exhilarating, they're wonderful, but the air is real thin. There's no vegetation there. But it's in the valley. It's in the valley where everything's a little bit rough. Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I thank God that Jesus has always been with us in the valleys. Can I get an amen? Amen. I thank God for the valley walkers in my life. They've walked with me. This was a sermon I was going to preach. It looks like I'm doing it already. I thought about it. This, it wasn't preached last week. It's just something that came to me on the plane. Amen. But I thought about how many times I've been with wave walkers. People have been with me in exhilarating great times. Man, I've had some exhilarating times. Wonderful times. They've been a part of that. But then it's the valley walkers that have really blessed me. Those James have walked with me through the valley. They've been with me in the low times of life. That, that helped me when the, the passing of my sister and my dad. And, you know, and it made me a valley walker. I wanted to be with people in the valley. When they've been sick, when they've been down, when they've been troubled. Amen. I wanted to walk with them because it's in the valley that we find the most. Actually, our lives, that's where we grow. We don't grow on the mountaintops. That's the exhilarating times. Again, that's the thin air. But, man, when I get down in the valley, I know that he walks with me. And he talks. So here they are. They're in the valley. I mean, they are in the valley. Cleophas and the other disciple, they, they're walking home. They're depressed. They're down. The scripture said they were talking with each other about everything that happened. I mean, can you imagine what they were saying to each other? I saw him beaten. I saw him tried. I saw him spit in his face. Listen, if you spit in the face of one of my friends, and I'm there, and I'm not able to get to you, I will remember you. I'll remember what Roman soldier did that. Amen. I'll remember this. And so they remember, and they're talking about it, and the beating, and the crucifixion. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Amen. He said of them that their hearts were slow. When I read this, I realize in our lives we live with two hearts. There's this slow heart that's lethargic. As a matter of fact, you know as I do, if your heart slows down too much, you will have to have an operation because the blood flow is not there, and they will do things to get it going again. If your 
heart quits. They put these defibrillators on you. They will shock you with electricity. They will shove heat into your body to make it pop back out to get your heart working again. Amen. Sometimes folks jump on your chest and start slapping you. And you don't want to get mad at them. They're trying to bring you back alive. I can't do that as your pastor. But sometimes I want to walk around with some spiritual defibrillators. And look at some of you that I love so much. It hits you just one good tap. Amen. And they make that heart start working again. Get you excited about the things of God one more time. Amen. Because what happens in life, you start slowing down. Because see, the issue in life is simply this. Your genesis will determine your revelation. It's how you start. It's how you finish. Amen. I started with a very fiery heart. I want to finish with a fiery heart. I don't want to get slow of heart. I don't want life to bog me down. He said to them in verse 25, how slow, how slow of heart to be. You're, you're slow to believe. That's why I like kids. Children are quick to believe. Some of you have convinced your children that some fat guy in a red suit and a white beard slides down a chimney that you don't even have. <laughs> that brings you presents. Amen. Some of you have helped children believe that there is a rabbit out there that lays eggs. I have had rabbits most of my childhood, and not one of them laid a cotton-picking egg. Come on, children are quick to believe. Amen. They believe stuff. So why don't we teach them about the resurrection? Why don't we tell them that Jesus bled for them, died for them, and rose again for them? He's the reason for Christmas. He's the reason for Easter. Come on, give me an Amen. Amen. Verse 27, he began with Moses and the prophets and he explained to them him. Last week I told you that, that Jesus was from the beginning. As a matter of fact, the Pharisees sought to kill him because Jesus said, Abraham loved seeing his day. That even Abraham knew that when Jesus showed up, things were going to get better. Why? Because Abraham had sin in his life. And when Jesus died on the cross, it took away Abraham's sins. Can I get an amen? He said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He was glad to see me. So here we find that he starts with Genesis and starts moving forward. Now, before I get there, uh, let, let me break this down to you. In verses 28 through 32, the Scripture said he acted as if he were going further. He did that when he was walking on the waves. He acted as if he would pass the disciples when he was walking on the waves. They had to call him into themselves. And the scripture says, after he, so first, that's the first thing that gives me an idea. That Jesus always acts as if he's going a little further. He's waiting on you to say, hey, can you come fellowship with me? See, the issue is, uh, is never, is, is God is always ready for our company. He's always ready for our fellowship. He's waiting on you to respond. You know, some folk come to church and they say, well, I don't know if worship's going to be good today. Worship will be good if you decide it's good. Amen. The scripture says, I will, I will rejoice. I will exalt the Lord. I will. In other words, I have determined in my heart that I'm going to do this. I don't wait on feeling the movement of the spirit before I start moving. I'm going to move the spirit. Amen. Amen. Because he's always willing. So Jesus is always willing. He's going to act like going to pass by them, but they invite him. They, it, 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 they pull him, say, come stay with us. Then he gets with them, and he gets together. Have you ever sat down with somebody to eat, and they just start eating, with, and they, they don't think about blessing the food? Oh, I do it all the time. I mean, I don't do it. I sit with folk all the time. A lot of time is my kids. I don't care who it is. I'm going to start praying over that food. Because I don't know who cooked it. I worked in a restaurant once. Hello. I mean, I don't know who cooked it. I don't know what's in it. So I'm going to ask the Lord. First, I'm going to give him thanks for the food. I thank you for the food you provided for me today. I ask you to bless it to the nourishment of my body. I don't care if it's peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I thank you for that food. Amen. I just say it's a, it's a common practice. I feed my dog. Before Coda eats, I pray over his food. I put my hand on his head. And he won't eat till I pray. And there have been times Max was another dog I had like that. And there are times I've been gone that other people have fed them and called me and said, Hey, Pastor, hey, Dad, the dog won't eat. I said, Did you pray over the food? Oh, my God, I forgot. Go out and pray over the food and the dog starts eating. Come on. So Jesus sits down and he's with them and I can see them. They're hungry. They've been walking seven miles. They're tired, man. They get into the house and they sit down to eat and as they start to eat, Jesus says, well, hold, hold up. 
Let me pray over this food. Then he broke the bread, then he blessed the bread, and the scripture says, after he done that, their eyes were open. Mannerisms open eyes. There are times you'll watch certain people do a certain thing, and you'll say, I know who your daddy is. Because <laughs> I'm watching your manners. Amen. You picked that up from somewhere. His mannerisms exposed him. Imagine their astonishment. Their eyes were open, and they looked to him and went, you're j and before they could get Zeus out, he's gone. You're j he's gone. Amen. He, he just vanished. He disappeared. Amen. And all of a sudden, they said, did not our hearts burn within us? Any time that I have had a visitation with Jesus, my heart burns. Amen. You get your heart burned back. Can I get an amen? Amen. You go from a dull to a dangerous heart. This is when you're the most dangerous. This is when you're most willing to take risk. This is when you're the most willing to do something crazy. You know what they did? They had walked seven miles, but they turned around and ran back. Amen. They had gone one place and said, you know, this. I, I'm, I'm going back the other way. I, I got to head back. We're not our hearts burning within us. When he opened the scriptures to us, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written. And everything Jesus did, he fulfilled scripture. Amen. From the beginning, amen, to the end. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the Scripture. The Scripture says that as they did that, and if you keep reading, they start heading back. He opened the Scripture. Can you see the lights going on? Can you see the lights going on? When I started walking through the Bible, I start seeing lights go on. I see things happening. Your heart starts picking up. If I went back into the Scripture for you right now and I hit Genesis, in Genesis, he's the seed that will crush Satan's head. The scripture says that, that it, even God spoke to him. And after Eve and Adam took the apple, he said, listen, devil. He said, one day the seed is going to crush your head. You may crush his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And from Genesis chapter 3 on, you're going to find that Satan always tried to kill the seed of God. Amen. He tried to kill it during Exodus when, when, uh, with Moses, wiped out all the little boys in Bethlehem. Amen. He wiped out all the little boys. He's always trying to take care of the seed to make sure the seed couldn't get there. But God hid the seed. I love this thought. God hid the seed, amen, so that he could never find it. He ran that seed all the way from Genesis up into the book of Matthew chapter 1. Amen. He even ran it through Rahab the prostitute. You ain't never going to think to look there. Can I get an Amen. Amen. He just kept running that seed all the way through. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. When you get to Exodus, they're slaying little lambs. But you don't realize it, that when Jesus died on the cross, they were killing lambs in the, in the temple. Amen. He was the lamb of God. That's why they put blood on the doorpost. Amen. To make sure that when the death angel passed over, and I still to this day have red bandanas over my doors. Amen. In my house. Reminding God, amen, the blood is over this house. Can I get an amen? I've gone to people's houses and I've anointed it with oil and pleaded the blood of Jesus in that house. People come to me and say, Pastor, we got spirit in this house. Amen. I don't know who lived here, but they, they must have had all kind of Ouija boards and Dungeons and Dragons, all kind of stuff. And they spirits to come and pray over this house. Go pray over that house and pieces in that house. And don't be afraid to pray over your house. I don't care if it's your dog house. In Leviticus, he's the atoning sacrifice. In Numbers, he was the serpent, the bronze serpent. Have you seen the medical symbol? The medical symbol is a cross with a snake on it. It started out of the book of Numbers. Jesus was there. Moses, they had back, uh, they had talked against Moses, went against Moses. Miriam, his own sister, did that. And all of a sudden, God sent serpents, started biting people. Eight man, a hundred something of them, a hundred thousand of them died. And Moses said, God, what am I going to do? I got to stop this. And he said, well, if they repent, we will. They did. And he said, all right, they're going to turn it around. He said, take a, take a snake, put a serpent on a stick, and hold it up. And anybody that looks will live. Look and live. And when Jesus died on the cross, he became a curse for all of us. Amen. And all the sins of the world were put upon him. He is my medical staff. Hallelujah. He is my Dr. Jesus. I look to him when I need help. Look and live. That's Calvary, my friend. Deuteronomy, he's a promised prophet. And Joshua, he's a warrior with a sword. Joshua is fixing to go in and conquer the land. He thinks he's God's promise to everything. And in a, in a, in a Angel shows up with a sword. And Joshua looks at him before he goes in. Moses is dead. He's fixing to take the people across the, uh, into the promised land. And the, so, the, the sword wheeling angel shows up. And he says to him, what do you think you're doing? And you know what the angel said? I'm here to take over. Matter of fact, Joshua said, you for me against me. 
You're a bad boy if you say that to an angel with a sword. You for me against you. The angel said, neither. I'm here to take over. Follow me in. Amen. We're going to conquer this promised land. Hallelujah. He's the warrior with the sword. In Judges, he's our deliverer. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, the kings and the chronicles, he's the promised king. In Ezra and Nehemiah, he's the restorer of the nations. In Esther, he's our advocate. In Job, he's our redeemer. Our redeemer lives. Job, Job said, shall I take good or bad from him? Amen. I, that's not the way life is. I'm just going to respect him and tell you he is the He's my redeemer. In Psalms, he's all in all. In Proverbs, he's our pattern in wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's our goal. In Song of Solomon, he's our beloved. In Cindy song, the song, he's the song of songs. Amen. No other song been written. He's the song of songs. All the minor prophets. He's the coming prince of peace. In Matthew, he's the Christ the King. Jesus is talking to those disciples. And he's going back from Genesis and he's working it all the way forward. And they're set and they still hadn't caught it. They still, but their heart is starting to burn. It's starting to warm up. In Mark, he's a servant. In Luke, he's the son of man. In John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's Christ ascended, seated, and sending. All the letters, he's Christ indwelling and filling Christ in you, the hope of glory. In the book of Revelation, he's Christ returning and reigning. Hallelujah. So as he does that, the hearts begin to work. That's why the word of God, the scripture, the scripture, put your heart alive again. Don't wait for Monday or Sunday. Amen. Get into Scripture. Keep reading it and find out what happened. Hey, since he's all that, why are we sitting with dull, slow hearts, walking back to our former ways into Dullsville? Does not our heart burn within us? Jesus can walk the road with us. We can look straight at him and not recognize him. The disciples, they're walking. You know what? When Jesus said, what's going on? They, they reverted back to their past. You know where they go? They're going back to their past. <sighs> What's the old saying H.F. said for years? A man with no future reverts back to his past. When you don't see yourself in your future, you go back to the way you once were. If it was addiction, you go back to it. If it's dull living, you go back to it. When you can't see yourself in your future, when all you think about is your past, and you bring up your past, and you talk about your past, Philippians tells us, press it on to that which is ahead, forgetting the things that are past. Uh, this may sound a little bit mean, but some folk got their head so far up their past, they'll never see their future. Right. Don't write that down, Cheryl. That's all they, they can't see, nothing. You got to see your future. So when Jesus came to them and started opening up the scripture to them, their hearts got on fire. Amen. They went from slow to burning. You have two hearts. You have two hearts. I'm afraid, not afraid, I know that the pandemic last year exposed hearts. And there were people that just, their heart became slower and slower and slower. And they turned and they walked away from the cross, and they're still walking. You know what? I'll never condemn them. I'll never put them down. I will share the word with them and pray to God their heart catches fire again. Amen. Whether in my lifetime or whenever it's going to happen, that their heart catches on fire and comes back toward him. My children, I pray for their hearts to catch on fire. For your kids, your parents, your family, their hearts catch on fire. So when your heart catches on fire, you go from sorrow to hope. Amen. From self-pity to all. From worry to wander. Amen. From doubt to belief. From tugging our way to going his way. Amen. From depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, which Peter said after the catching of the fish, to forsaking all and following him. Joseph, if you'd come on up. I think about our hearts and how that our hearts. The scripture says, don't let your heart condemn you. Amen. When you believe God. You've got to trust in him. You've got to have faith that God took away your sins, washed away your past. You know, when you go from a murmur or a slow heart, it makes the journey wearisome. This is what I know, that when your heart, your physical heart starts clotting up and slowing down, it's hard to go from A to B. You're trudging, you're pressing. Spiritually, it happens. We clog our heart with so many things in this world that there's no freedom in it with it no more. We can't press in. We can't pray more than two or three minutes. Even we can't read the Bible much. Uh, we can't witness. Uh, our passion for God starts to wane. In. Amen. Discouragement begins to set in. But a burning heart keeps us going on the journey. It inspires us to run. 
push forward. Why do we keep getting stuck? See, I don't think they, they stopped moving. I think they just got stuck. They just got stuck. We don't understand the scriptures. Sometimes bad theology produces poor behavior. Sometimes our theology says, well, once you prayed one time, you ain't got to pray again. Once you've been to church once, you don't have to go again. Don't worry about fellowship. It doesn't matter. Well, you forgot that bad company corrupts good manners. Did you forget all that? Amen. So it was important for us to be here. We just get stuck with some bad theology. The root is how we see God and don't see God. It comes from wanting another God other than Him. So we've invented, and I believe this. I see it among believers. that We invent this safe, nice pampering, overlook and accommodate the way I live. And we begin to see God in a different way. And yes, in a sense, He is our refuge. He's our fortress. He's our shelter. He's a shield about us. He's our comfort and peace. But that's not what I mean. We want God to be comfortable rather than comforting. When I stand back from this pulpit, I read Romans 8, 15 out of the message. Greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? See, that to me gets my heart burning again. I ask God, Lord, I'm 60 years old. What's next? What are we going to do next? How are we going to win the loss and integrate the body and nurture people? Can you keep, I need my heart to be on fire for you. This slow heart is almost, it's causing me to trudge. It reminds me to stay safe. I don't want to live a safe life. I want to live a life full of risk. I want to live a life on the edge. I want to press forward. I want to wake up, God, every day wondering, what's next? What do you have for me next? With every head bowed, eye closed. We do not condemn these two disciples. No, 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 no. We would have been like Peter, away from him as they took him to crucify. We'd have been like these two disciples walking away, wondering what went on. We've heard about the miracles. We've heard about the. But when Jesus came and sat before them and then disappeared, they saw a miracle. I, too, have seen miracles. I got to believe God for a future. I got to press forward. I got, got to stay after it. What good is life without living? You got to taste it. You got to live it. Even at the risk of an occasional failure and adversity. As your pastor, I can't spare your tears, your fears, or your traumas. Each passion has its cross of validity. But it will be what we all desire that will express how deeply we love. Amen. God, we love you. With those heads bowed, eyes closed. If your heart has been slow. If your heart has been slow. Slow to believe. Slow, slow, just slow. Now, I ain't saying you don't know him. Yeah, you're his, you're his believer. You're his disciple. But it's just been slow. Slip your hand up right now. It's just been slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's honesty all over this house. Amen. Just hold those hands up. Now pray this with me. Lord Jesus, set my heart afire. Let your word speak to me. Let it be sweet oil, honey on my lips. Let me enjoy your presence again. When I pray, let me know you hear me. You love me. I'm your child. Forgive me for allowing my heart to grow dull. Fire me up again. Fire me up again. Fire me up again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, come on, give God a praise that's worthy of him. Come on, give him praise all over this house. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One of the worst theologies that I've ever heard is that, that you've got to be quiet in church. That the women got to be silent. Man, you tell a woman to be quiet, you're in trouble already. And that theology pumped out out there telling women to stay quiet. To tell, tell everybody. Be, God, God is not nervous. He never gets nervous at the sound of your praise. Amen. Your voice to him is sweet. Hallelujah. It's a sweet savor unto him. That's what our worship is. From slow heart, my heart has been slow. We have two hearts. We fight with them. We have two natures.
Amen. We have we, we got the flesh and we got the spirit. Amen. We we coming out of darkness into light. This fight will go on till the day you enter the kingdom. Amen. So keep fighting, church. Amen. Keep pressing in. Can I get an amen? Amen. There's envelopes in front of you. Amen. If you don't have an envelope, you have a phone. If you have a phone, you're able to go to holywild.net slash give. Hallelujah. I, I don't want to sound crude, mean, or ups, upset in any way, shape, fashion, or form. I ain't preached on giving in a long time. But one thing I do know this. The Scripture teaches that if you are not a giver, you're not a tither, you're a thief. That's what it says, that we're thieves. We've robbed God. How can a man rob God? We rob him with our tithe and our offering. Amen. We're going to pass the plate, boys. We're going to pass the buckets, all right? Amen. We're going to go back. We're going to try to get back to some sense of normalcy, whatever that is. It's great to pastor a church that's never been normal. Come on up, guys. Come on all the way to the front. Amen. Let me give you a couple of quick announcements. You love Jesus? I got to keep checking on you. Some of your faces tend to tell me you're mad at me. Checking again. All right, they're better now. Amen. Ken's brother, good to have you here. Ken, good to have you, brother. I don't, I forget your name. Billy, thanks for coming today. Good to have you here, sir. Hey, I see you looking at your phone. You're looking at, your, you weren't texting while you were, I was preaching. You were, you were keeping up with scripture. I know you were taking, look at you at your age. You're gray-headed, long-haired, and you got a phone, and you know how to use it. Miracles never cease. Amen. So if you're giving on your phone, make sure you tithe on it through the holywild.net. Amen. So I'm going to go ahead and say this, and then I'll read the announcements to you. That way you can just stay seated. Amen. As we give today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Amen. You stay seated. Stay seated while I talk to you. This helps you just because a lot of times you get up, you want to leave me. Don't leave me just yet. Amen. Coming soon, we will have our church merch together. We got to get this uh the PayPal or whatever it is going to be for you. So you can be at home and you can order a little country church shirt from home and have it delivered straight to your house. Amen. So it'll be different brands, about two or three different brands. Last week you saw me wear one that said Misfit on it. Amen. One of my favorite ones is the church where Misfits fit. April the 24th, Off-Road Misfits will be meeting here at the Crosby campus for coffee and donuts. Amen. At 9 o'clock, heading to Extreme Off-Road Park. That's down the road here, I do believe. Yeah, is that right? Uh, Travis, the park is down the road here, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. I see y'all down there. Y'all going to be washing some muddy vehicles when it is over. April 24th, gather here. I see a lot of Jeeps out. This is Jeep country. People love Jeeps. Amen. So bring your Jeep out. April 28th. Uh, Joseph, say something about April the 28th, Fields of Faith. Uh, Fields of Faith, we started this about six years ago. Uh, and it's all over. It's nationwide, but it's it's a it's a meeting night for teenagers to come and worship together. And our church actually, uh, as of like three years ago, pastor when we had Wednesday nights canceled it so that we could all go out there. And we've always had like 100, 150 adults there too. So it's been always been amazing to see our church support this. But it's a free event. Uh, one of our students at the North Campus, she's gonna give her testimony during it, which is in front of like a thousand people. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, it's a pretty cool event but it's it's free for everybody so joseph said this thing is worldwide i mean all over the united states but the local one here is at randall reed so if you'd like to come out and be a part i love it and it, it doesn't it's about an hour long or so but emma ray is going to be sharing she has led worship here been a part of worship here so excited about hearing her testify about the goodness of god in her life yeah. that's april the 28th and that, that so that'll be coming up here won't it joseph uh, that is this wednesday night this wednesday night amen so Two Wednesdays. Is it two Wednesdays? What? Yeah. Okay. Today is the 18th. My bad. I saw 2021. I thought it was the 21st. Close. I'm a rookie at this. Come on. Uh, little Country Church kids are going to have a daddy-daughter dance. Amen. May the 15th out at the ranch. June 22nd, Camp Holy Wild Summer. Ropes course will start. So save the dates. You know, I, I, I spoke to the pastors up there about our OCD. 
because people said, you know, what do churches to do? Uh, and I said, our volunteers is what makes our church so good. Right. Amen. Whether they're volunteering here at the door, greeting, working with our kids out at the ranch for the ropes course, swimming pool, in the cafeteria. And they, and they looked at me and said, what is OCD? I said, it's old, cantankerous, and dangerous. I said, I, I don't know what it is, and don't take this wrong, but a lot of people, before they go to heaven, they come to the little country church. Amen. And we wear them out out at the ranch. Hallelujah. They, they work on the robes course. They're there. But here's the thing. A lot of times people have gone through life, and they feel like they have not invested in the kingdom of God. They've not invested enough finances, enough of their treasures, their tithe, their time, uh, their talent. And they get to this place in life, and they go, you know, I want to do something. And they retire and say, I don't want to just sit home. And they come out to the ranch, and they, they may just be holding a rope, H, at the course. They might be uh, pulling somebody up on the big giant swing. They might be helping hook harness somebody up downstairs. They may be at the swimming pool, uh, doing things at the pool, the lifeguard. They might be in the kitchen, help serving. But they want to do something to add value to the end of their life for the kingdom of God's sake before they die. And you call me crazy. I've been doing call me crazy. Crazy. Say, call me crazy. Call me crazy. I've been doing this for 18 years out there, and we have more people that have come through there that have worked with us. And then you've been with me six years, Joseph. You've seen it already. That have come out and worked with us over the years. And and they pass away. Right. But they're that they their happiest times have been out there working with the kids. Yeah. Amen. Whether it be Jimmy Roberts or Bear or, or, or Mr. Gant or, you know, I got an arena still. It's called the Gant Arena out there. They, they come out and do things at the ranch. Amen. Before they go. So don't be afraid to come out. It doesn't mean you're going to die soon. <laughs> it did, didn't it? It kind of sounded like it. Well, you can sit home dying, you lazy boy. All right. Or you can come out there and work with us first. Amen. So I think, think it's a good thing. Hallelujah. Kids summer camp, July 12th through the 14th. And then uh, I do know there is another camp for uh, the uh, fifth and sixth graders. Do you know when that is? Yeah. It's, I don't know when. Is it, it after is. this camp? It's, I think it's before. Actually, I think it's in June. Okay. We'll have to look for it. But there is another camp that we want to invite. Uh, K through sixth grade is here, but there will be a special camp for fifth to sixth graders that are leaving our ranch. But in other words, they're going somewhere else to have camp. So just want to make that available to anybody that would like to go. All right. Amen. Would you stand with me? Joseph, will you pray us out? Absolutely. Uh, Father, again, we're just so grateful to be in your house. Lord, I pray as we leave this place that we don't leave the church, we leave as the church, and that we just represent you and honor you and uh, just share your goodness with people by the way we live our life, not have to go out and pre be preachy, but genuinely just love people. And I just pray we represent you well as we leave here. We thank you for all the guests that are here. We pray that you continue to bless them as well. And uh, we just love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.